them introduce themselves as we go through. Um, so over to you first, Jane. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and um, are you going to be moving the slides on, Emma? Yeah, great. I just want to um, say right from the beginning um, that I'm a nurse by background, so I'm not a housing worker, but I have some of my colleagues from MHCLG on the call. I'm a health and homelessness advisor with the Rough Sleepers Initiative at um, the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government. So as I said, my background's nursing and I've been very involved both in this job, but in previous jobs as well around um, hospital discharge. And it's a really important issue. I actually qualified yesterday um, as a nurse 40 years ago. So that was something to celebrate. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Emma. Just to um, set the scene, really. So, with the Homeless Reduction Act duty to refer, um, the definition of homelessness is um, a person who's been threatened with homelessness where they're likely to become homeless within 56 days. And before it used to be 28 days. And also, they may have been served with a valid notice under Section 21 of the Housing Act by their landlord which expires within 56 days. Um, so it covers people sleeping rough, single homeless people and families living in hostels, temporary accommodation or bed and breakfast hotels. Also uh, hidden homeless, so the sofa service, surfers, and some people who may be um, also at risk of um, exploitation who are in that uh, category. And also the chronically insecurely housed, the so people who go in and out of frequent move, movers go between rough sleeping and homelessness, but also maybe living in uh, very poor conditions of housing. OK, thanks, Emma. Um, and why is this issue so important? Well, we don't want to see people discharged to the streets. And um, very often uh, people we work with may be vulnerable. Um, they they may have uh, personal issues which impact on their health. Um, they, they may be experiencing systems which cause barriers. And we know the bureaucracy that often occurs and, and problems with accessing, including GP registration. And also very often we see people who are homeless, particularly people who are experiencing rough sleeping, who have both mental and physical health problems and substance misuse issues and their health deteriorates very quickly on the street and obviously they've come into hospital with a health issue and it just isn't uh, the right thing for them to be discharged to the street we're, we're going to see deterioration in the health and also uh, an increase in their vulnerability and we do know uh, it has an impact on those on the um, the deaths of people we see people who are dying early um, and also with this in this cohort, we're seeing premature aging. So we are seeing people who are now presenting with early dementia and also some physical problems around mobility and who need extra support. So it's it's important to recognize people's vulnerability and especially around safeguarding and make sure that they don't end up on the street and they go into the right sort of housing so that pathway between hospital and the housing department is absolutely key. OK, next slide, thanks. Um, just a, another bit of background. So the Homeless Reduction Act 2017 reformed England's homelessness legislation, creating new statutory duties, and it came into force um, on the 3rd of April 2018 and became effective from the 1st of October 2018. So it's been um, around for, an, you know, over two years now, but often we know that um, health professionals have no idea that there is this new duty and this new relationship that needs to be in place with a referral process between the hospital and duties were placed to intervene at earlier stages to prevent homelessness in the area and relieve homelessness for single homeless people regardless of priority need and or intentionality and to help 
person or household to get access to homelessness services. And that includes advice, but also when they are seen and there's assessment going on, it's also about the production of personal plans to, to identify vulnerability, health needs and getting the right support in place as well. And, and that's where the partnership working is absolutely key as well. OK, next slide, thanks. So the Act introduced a legal duty on specified public authorities to refer service users who they <laughs> think may be homeless or threatened with homelessness within 56 days to local to the local authority homelessness or housing options teams. And this is a list of people who need to um, make those referrals and have that legal duty. And it includes emergency departments, so our local A&E departments, urgent treatment centres and hospitals, so providing inpatient services. So it is a legal duty. But what we found out is very often health workers are unaware of this. So this is why it's important to, to uh, raise this issue with local um, hospitals in particular and and to have that relationship with, between housing and health is absolutely key. OK, thanks, Emma. And so just to keep it simple and um, uh, so what the health worker needs to know, they need to identify a person's housing status, um, either disclosed or if you consider a person to be homeless, and it, it's maybe asking their address and if they're not able to give an address or they you notice their address has changed or there's frequent um, changes of address. And also ask questions, can they receive post? Are they still living there? So and I'll go through some other questions as well and identify which local housing authority they want to be referred to, which isn't as easy as it sounds. So it's do they have a local connection there? Have they got family? You know, have they been working there? So it, it's about asking some specific questions as well about where they want to be discharged to. And also to obtain their consent is absolutely crucial. Um, before you make a referral, you'll need to ask the person for their consent and explain why you're making the referral and the help that can be given them. Um, as they're homeless or at risk of homelessness and then complete the referral form or send an email or make a phone call. So it's about knowing what the local plans are. Um, so having that relationship with your local housing authority and, and having a procedure in place. Um, and so it is for health workers to think, is this person homeless? Ask some questions, open up that conversation and make that referral. In A&E it may be more difficult, but if you think somebody's rough sleeping or you can ask them, have they got somewhere safe to stay tonight? It often opens up that conversation. OK, next slide, Emma, and we'll go into some. Um, so these are, are some of the questions that you can ask. So have you got somewhere to set safe to stay um, when being discharged or leaving the hospital? Where are they currently staying? Do they feel safe and secure there? Um, so it is about opening up that conversation with people and the way that you frame your questions. And it may be that it's somebody who's experienced or experiencing domestic abuse or other threats of violence um, from either people they're living with or a landlord. So, um, or if you think they may be being abused as well. And in A&E, you can often, um, you may have concerns around who's with them, whether they the person with them is allowing them to be seen on their own. Um, so there may be um, uh, behaviour that from somebody they with or their own behaviour, the nervousness or um, or the physical signs of abuse that you see that that raise the issue and, and um, you can ask some some questions. Um, and do, do they have any debt problems? And they may come up as well. They may disclose that they they are in rent arrears or um, they're not able to pay um, their mortgage. So it, it's questions like that or information that comes up that may lead to you wanting to make a referral. Problems with the landlord, you know, have they been threatened with eviction? And also have they ha got a history of being in care, armed forces or prison, which 
also um, helps for housing to know that as well. OK, next slide. You need as the, it's the individual's name, their contact details, which um, which also may be, you know, where do they get their post? Are they being supported by an, a local agency, a day centre? Um, do they have a key worker, somebody who also they'd be happy to be um, contacted and be involved in um, supporting them through the process as well? And agree a reason, agreed reason for referral. You know, are they currently homeless or threatened with homelessness? Um, and the area they want to be in. So, you know, do they live or work in the area? Have they got family there? Or is there another special reason? Are they fleeing domestic violence, for instance? OK, next slide. Thanks, Emma. OK, so the process in place, and this is where the partnership working is quite key. Services need to work together to design the referral process. So um, what forms are needed? how you make a referral, whether it's by phone, whether it's by um, an established email and template. Um, and, and you want to have a seamless service so the referral can be made and then the person either seen at the housing department and it may be with an advocate who goes with them. And we've seen that working really well. When I worked in South London with King's College Hospital and St Thomas's Hospital around their hospital discharge procedure and it was a specialist team they actually um, had workers who would also accompany people to housing and help them through the process but also um, it's it's good to make the referral as early as possible if someone's on the ward so then the procedures can start in place um, not on the last day or not on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock or something but actually have um, an, a plan in place much earlier on where the person's going, is it suitable in terms of their mobility and, and support needs. So that, that partnership working is really key to work out the process. And very often it can just be a, a phone call and, and the housing worker comes onto the ward or one of the, the, the discharge team can help with uh, um, some of the form filling and also key around discharge that health information is, is passed on to housing as well. So that personal plan can be um, also fit into the person's health needs as well. And also to have a single point of contact for referrals. So have a, a person who's who's named in the housing department or have one referral process, one email that that's there. So it's, it's less confusing and makes it much more seamless. And as I said, to make the referral as early as possible. And also, one, if you make the referral as early as possible, there's also an opportunity, if needed, to have those multidisciplinary team meetings with the multi-agency input. So if someone's got quite complex and multiple needs, you can actually have that plan discharge and be implementing good practice so you don't see people either being discharged to the streets or going to accommodation where they don't have the right levels of support or it's it's um, not right in terms of their mobility. But actually it can be, um, you can have those referrals and assessments in place as well for social services or physio or OT, for instance. So it is about having that process in place, having it written up, having posters in place. Um, and I know in Reading, you know, they, they've done a lot of work around how they communicate both with staff, but also for people who are homeless to be able to to um, to know what's happening and and to have that information as in place as well, which also makes the discharge much easier as well. OK, next. So this is my email address if people want to contact me and also just to say that there is a um, program you can go into at the Health Education England um, where they have done a training program specifically for health professionals around Homeless Reduction Act duty to refer, and it takes it through much slower than I've rushed through today. Um, and it has quizzes, but it also has examples of good practice. So I would 
encourage you to to have a look at that. You can register on, on um, online with Health Education England, and they've got other information around health and homelessness as well, which is really useful. So, OK, sorry it was rushed, but we're short of time. So um, we'll move on. That's brilliant. Thank you, Jane. Um, I will hand over to Sarah, but just briefly, we've got the links to that um, training program a bit later on that um, uh, colleague Debbie from NHS England has put on there for us. So thanks ever so much for that, Jane. I'll hand over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Lovely. So my name is Sarah Charters. I'm a consultant nurse from the emergency department in Southampton General Hospital. And I'm here to speak with you today about um, the vulnerable adult support team, which is a, a team I set up in the ED um, eight and a half years ago now. And um, I'll talk a bit about how the team um, supports people who are homeless. Hopefully this will move on. I've. Yeah. Oh. Great. So um, just a bit of background to the service. Um, I'm an ED nurse by background. I've, I've worked in the field for 30 years now and um, I undertook um, probably about 15 years ago a trainee consultant nurse programme and um, within that an entrepreneurial module was part of a master's degree and that gave me um, the idea to set up a, a post um, within my department, focusing on the area which I feel really passionate about, which is people with vulnerabilities, um, psychosocial problems, and then um, the role also developed into working with people um, who present through the mental health crisis pathway. Um, when I first came into post, which was back in two 2010, I thought that I could give lots of education to the ED staff, put protocols, guidelines and pathways in place, and then they'd all do what I wanted them to do. And that proved to be quite a challenge. Um, we have quite a transient workforce in ED. Um, our junior doctors change every four months. And um, and so trying to keep um, that, that level of um, workforce that you know who are moving frequently um up to together with everything around managing vulnerable patients is really difficult when they also have to know how to treat the um, heart attack and the stroke and the major major trauma in the ed setting um also as i'm sure you're all aware there's a real complexity around managing people with psychosocial problems and it's not infrequent for um, our patients to have to or more vulnerabilities. Um, the frequency of contact. So I might give someone a really good teaching session on how to intervene for um, a patient who presents with homelessness or domestic abuse, for example. But if they then don't see that person or, or someone presenting with that problem for three to four or, or six months, um, there, there's going to be skill fade. Um, also, as I'm sure you know, the ED clinicians um, work under considerable pressure. It's a fast paced environment and um, they um, have so four hours um, is the, our totality to see a patient, examine them, work out what's wrong with them and treat them and then move them on either um, to a safe discharge or to a admission. And our staff, um, each nurse is, is usually looking after five to six patients. And so they just don't have the time um, to sort of kick back with one patient and fully understand their situation and, um, and, and give a, a meaningful intervention. Um, yeah, so my solution um, was to uh, pilot a vulnerable adult support team. And um, I know Sandy Jerem is on the call and um, I always call Sandy the godmother of VAST because as a commissioner, she's the person who helped us um, access the funding and set the team up. Um, we put the team in place and I'll tell you more about them shortly, um, but they were an absolute immediate success with our clinical team um, who were very relieved to have a team of practitioners available to um, support them in managing these um, patients who, who have considerable complexity. And we also very quickly received positive evaluation from our community partners and um, the end result was increased referrals. So funding, as I said, we've had superb commissioner support all the way through the lifetime of the service. Um, we started off um, 
bid into an innovation fund which came out of um, successful achievement of a local area stretch target. Um, we had the funding for 12 months and I brought staff in on a fixed term contract, but they were seconded from um, other ED um, um, roles, um, most predominantly as healthcare assistants, so that they had job security at the end of the pilot period if, if things didn't work out. Um, but as I said, fantastic success, um, but quite tricky to pull um, permanent funding in. So we um, went for another 12 months with fixed term, then another six months, then another six months. And then um, we um, went to the mental health pump prime funds and we were successful um, over two cycles of pump prime funding um, to fund um, VAST and in fact expand it. And then from there we moved to being a commission service and um, and we have um, um, from the, where we've had support from the commissioners all the way through both Southampton and, and um, um, latterly West Hampshire, um, but also um, UHS financial commitment as well. And the team sit within the nursing budget, but they actually, I'd say, cross nursing, medicine and um, social work in terms of their role. So the team structure, there's me, um, one whole time equivalent as a consultant nurse. And then um, what we have now is 1.6 whole time equivalents at, at band four and 3.8 at band three. And um, we're supported from a HR management perspective from um, by our band six and seven nursing sisters. Um, as part of the team focus on high intensity users and we have um, now a doctor who works um, for two days a week, um, a coordinator for high intensity users who works four days a week in the role and a band seven mental health nurse who coordinates um, the care planning for mental health related high intensity users working three days a week. So we've expanded our team beyond our sort of prime um, primary shop floor delivery to people attending with psychosocial problems uh, to include our, our high intensity users. So our ways of working, the team cover from eight in the morning till 10 at night, seven days a week, and we practitioners on duty in the morning from eight till four, and then one at night from um, in the evening from two till 10. Um, if patients have attended overnight, we encourage our staff to make overnight referrals and the team will pick um, the patient up the next morning and um, do an intervention either by telephone if um, it was safe for the patient to be discharged before VAST came back on duty or face to face if um, the staff were concerned about safety and they've kept the patient overnight for us to see in the morning. Um, any staff member can refer and they just need to do it by either tannoying um, the team, um, a quick phone call or popping around to the office. So we try and make them as accessible as possible. And the team also monitor the triage um, commentary um, to spot keywords um, that identify patients who um, have psychosocial issues. Uh, there we go. So our service model, um, we, we really act within the framework of motivational interviewing. Um, so we try and come alongside our patients and understand the situation from their perspective and, and try and help them to achieve what they want to achieve. And I'll talk a bit more about that with a couple of examples shortly. Um, and then within their intervention, they identify psychosocial issues. So someone might be referred to us because of alcohol use, but we will also screen them for their housing status, risk of homelessness, um, whether they're safe at home, whether they're using drugs um, and are there any other um, concerns for them. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we identify the range of issues that the patient's experiencing, then we risk assess them using national and international um, risk um, frameworks uh, for pretty much everything we use. If there's not a national or international one, then, then we've developed our own local risk assessment. Um, once we've risk assessed them, we reflect back to them their level of, of risk um, relating to the issues they've disclosed. Um, we provide them with information about services available to support them. We um, undertake 
safeguarding interventions and that might be for the adult because they're at risk um, and it may be for their children uh, due to the hidden harm um, issue and so um, we we make um, quite a considerable number of, of child safeguarding referrals even though we're an adult um, facing team and then we signpost them to community services and um, refer if if consent is given so from a homeless point of view, homeless patients will be referred to VAST by the ED staff and then the practitioner will follow the standard VAST approach, um, as I've just described, to screen and manage all issues. Um, they're complete um, whatever appropriate risk assessments are required and um, they will um, submit um, either a duty to refer form or um, for Southampton residents the gateway form which is in much more detail and, um, and actually helps the street homeless prevention team to risk assess the patient and um, remotely and make decisions around um, placing them within services. Um, having done submitted either the duty to refer or the gateway form, um, then we liaise with the community service by telephone and agree a safe management or discharge plan. Um, if no accommodation is available, then we signpost them to day services and we also find out where um, they're, they're sleeping, if, if they're rough sleeping, so that they can be picked up by the street homeless prevention team um, the next um, day that they go on their, their early morning walk arounds of the city. Um, training and development, it's really key for the team. And so um, when I induct the staff, um, the, the key feature is that we visit all the services that they're likely to be referring patients into. So we visit the Cranberry Avenue Homeless Day Centre, um, we meet with the street homeless prevention team, the homeless healthcare team. Um, we go to Patrick House. Um, we discuss um, the role and meet with the homeless vulnerable adult support team, um, HVAST. And then we also visit the No Limits Young People's Service. And what we find is that the staff retain their knowledge of these services so much better by seeing the service in situ and meeting the staff rather than me trying to teach them about it in um, the classroom. Now, obviously, we've got some... Um, challenges now that COVID is, is an issue for us and um, thankfully I haven't had to induct anyone in the COVID era yet um, but I think we'll be looking to do that if we have to um, with virtual tours of the um, services. Um, we also have a presentation and a discussion around um, what's required of them um, managing um, the homeless patients in um, within ED and we have referral pathways and flow charts to support that and then we have ongoing CPD and refresher sessions with the appropriate services because as I'm sure you know um, service provision does um, change as, as the months and years go by. Um, I'm really pleased that we've got an expert within our team, um, one of our practitioners, Gina, who um, actually used to work in Patrick House before she moved to the service. And she's been doing some really fantastic service development work. Um, each member of the team has a lead for a different area and, um, and they take responsibility for making sure that we all do the best we can um, for patients who present with the issue that they're responsible for. So Jean has done some great work around developing patient information leaflets. Um, she undertakes monthly audits and that's supporting um, liaison with community partners and commissioners. And Jean is always part of that conversation when we have it. Um, and she provides updates um, to the rest of the team too. So I just wanted to talk about two cases um, that we've had uh, during COVID, which would give an example of the type of work the team does. Um, these pictures are looking fairly happy. Um, unfortunately, the patients we saw were not in quite such a happy situation. So if we go to the businessman first, we had a chap come to us who um, had tried to kill himself and he was from Finland and he had come over as a businessman, had been quite successful um, to begin with. Um, but then I think he'd had some relationship problems. He'd started drinking, his um, employment broke down. He um, was 
kicked out of the house by his partner, found himself in temporary accommodation. He had belongings stolen from him um, by one landlord, moved on to another landlord and had got to the point where he'd run out of money and run out of options. And he also did not have a passport anymore. Um, So he came to us in absolute despair, was seen by the mental health team and they felt that his... um, mental health crisis was more due to his psychosocial problems. And um, VAST and the mental health practitioners work really closely together and will often do joint assessments to save uh, the patients um, having to repeat their story. Now, one of my practitioners, Peter, saw this chap and um, one would think as, as in a traditional approach that you would risk assess the homelessness, risk assess the alcohol use and refer him into homeless and alcohol services, which is what Peter started doing. Um, but as part of the conversation, he asked the chap, sorry, that noise is me moving the keyboard. It's not anything worse than that, if you heard it. Um, so Peter actually, um, as part of the conversation, asked the patient what he wanted. And the patient said he wanted to go home, but he had no money, no passport and had no idea how he would ever be able to achieve that. Um, So Peter actually went very person centred. He contacted the Finnish embassy who said initially they couldn't help. Um, So he did a bit more Googling and found a Finnish Siemens mission that was based in London and engaged their help. They did some searching in Finland and identified this chap's family and secured agreement from his mother that um, she would fund um, an air flight uh, back to Finland. The mission agreed to um, fund his train fare up to London and they managed to get temporary um, documents from the Finnish embassy for him to travel. We kept him in our ward overnight so that he stayed engaged with us and we provided him um, with a taxi to the train station to get onto his train, to get onto his flight and be back with his family uh, the next day, um, which I feel um, really proud of um, because that was Peter using his initiative and being very person-centred to help the patient achieve what they actually wanted to Um, The second case was a lady who was homeless, um, but living in a tent um, in uh, with her partner who had mental health problems and who was very violent to her. And um, this couple were um, living in this tent in the midst of um, the um, first lockdown of COVID-19 when we knew that there would be hardly anyone out there that would hear her if she had any problems um, or, you know, if she was being attacked. And we saw her over um, probably about four attendances. She was very vulnerable. She was coming in with, with reasonably significant injuries. Each time she came in, the partner was outside waiting to... Um, Um, for her to come out again. He was hassling her by text and by phone Um, because of the level of her risk. And we genuinely thought she was going to be murdered. We um, referred her to the police and um, and into HERDA, which is our high risk domestic abuse pathway. And um, even though um, the police were attending, she wouldn't give consent uh, to give um, um, she wouldn't give a statement to them so that they could take legal action against this guy. Um, But eventually we built up trust with her over a number of attendances and she um, actually came um, to um, to trust our team. Um, And the option we came up with was that she gave us consent to tell the police about what had happened and give a statement so that she wasn't the person who actually um, did the dirty as such on on her partner. Um, So we did that um, with her consent and then the police were able to take party prosecution and she left the tent and moved in with family um, in London temporarily and um, and the chap went to prison um, for the abuse uh, but also access mental health care which hopefully will reduce his risk of, of abusing people in the future. So that's just a couple of examples of the type of work um, that VAST do. Um, Moving on, so just in summary, uh, a few slides to tell you what we think is 
is good about the team. Um, we have a well-trained and experienced team. Um, the members provide complex interventions and facilitate safe discharge plans for vulnerable patients. Um, they have delivered an increased health promoting role within ED, um, brief interventions, and we're absolutely convinced multiple life-saving referrals to specialist services. Identification of adult and child safeguarding issues, including the identification and reporting of hidden harm, and improved patient and carer experience of ED. And a really key thing is that our patients feel heard. And you know, people who sit down with them and take time to understand their situation, um, give appropriate empathy, and then um, step in um, with the patient's consent, work alongside them to give them um, the practical support they need. Um, so patients are helped to access community services and what we've, we've found over the years is that they're now um, accessing earlier intervention for many psycho psychosocial problems and we've transformed the communication between the ED and community partners um, and we've got close working relationships with over 25 community agencies in Southampton and Hampshire. Um, Importantly, time is released back um, to the ED clinicians and the mental health clinicians because they were trying um, in, in a, a far less adequate way to solve some of these issues when patients presented um, and taking up clinical time and not um, being as efficient as, as my team. And so we um, have improved um, the patient flow and efficiency by releasing them back to care. FAST also helps the ED to meet government policy, for example, the duty to refer. And we see on average about 50 homeless people a um, month who are referred into services. And um, we also help the trust to meet its CQC regulation. And in fact, our team um, in two CQC inspections now um, have been cited as an area of out outstanding practice with, with multiple sort of positive comments about the work that we do within the CQC. And um, through the work that we're doing um, with um, our high intensity users, um, we're, we're aiming for a reduction in repeat attendances. And Sarah Penny, who's one of my um, high intensity service user coordinator, does some really um, intense work, um, sometimes with the community services around um, um, people who are frequent attenders and also homeless. So just in summary, what we've set up in Southampton is a specialist team, which is very much part of the wider ED clinical team. Um, they operated face to face all the, all the way through COVID-19, um, through both waves, all the, you know, because they are part of our team. Um, they've got the time and the knowledge to provide meaningful interventions for people with a range of psychosocial problems, including homelessness. Um, they completely understand the duty to refer and are able to undertake timely referrals and um, they provide urgent liaison with homeless services, which does sometimes result in someone being accommodated the same day. And um, in every aspect of their work, um, they make every contact um, with these patients count. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation, and um, I don't, I've probably rabbited on a bit too long. Um, if I've got time, I'm happy to answer questions, or, or you can email me afterwards if I haven't got time. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Sarah and Jane, before you. Um, that's been brilliant. There are a couple of questions, and I, we, the, there's not a huge amount to update from a PhD perspective, so I think we can rattle through some of that, so it'd be good to um, take some of the questions now if that's okay um question from richard uh, lewis who's one of our meme colleagues um on the call in the chat is um asking if you get um multiple presentations from interviews you picked up on some of this um and how you managed to develop um, and build the relationships with individuals in what must be quite short bursts of contacts um, um how do you build the trust um and enable kind of quite candid responses from individuals who are potentially rough sleeping um i, th I think it's it's the um i think the the patients who come into our department kind of know that our team's there for them and um and i think 
you know, ED is a very fast paced environment. As I said, it's really high stimulus. It, it's a, you know, it's a difficult environment for a vulnerable patient to be in. And the fact that um, vast practitioners go and, and take time with them and um, listen to them, hear, hear the issues they've got and, and try and support them. Um, it really um, makes people um, know that we're there and, and we've got their back and that we're trying to um, help them. And um, and some of our patients are, are unfortunately very frequent in their attendance and and it does become a familiar face. And, um, you know, um, most of my team, I've got a number of practitioners within the team, um, but, you know, there are a number of patients who every single team member will know because they've met them at some point and um, they give a consistent approach um, no matter which practitioner sees them. And so I think that that also helps build trust because the patients know what they're going to get from us. Yeah, definitely. I think that's really important. Um, and a colleague, Jihad, from um, uh, Kent Medway is keen to uh, link up with you to learn more about the VAST service. Um, so I said I'd link him up with you if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, that'd <laughs> be absolutely fine. Early, but, yeah. Um, a lot of love for your work um, right. <laughs> and a little bit of a, a kind of conundrum from Amanda about resourcing and especially in areas where the flow may not warrant full time coverage. And Sandy's come back a bit on that in terms of kind of the recognition that your the service started with, you know, really a fraction of what it is now. And, and you've been able to kind of de develop the kind of case for change and return on investment and things. I don't know if you want to add any more to that or Sandy if you want to add any more you're welcome to come in. Well before Sandy speaks one thing yeah. I'll say is that I, I think people often don't realise just how much activity there is in, you know and even in smaller emergency departments they will have a large number of patients who present with this type of problem yeah. and probably in the sort of post-COVID austerity era um, I think that will will increase. Um, so yeah, we did start small and and build up, um, and we sort of proved the model as we went along. Um, but I I would be very surprised if there was any emergency department in the country that that couldn't justify having this type of service. And I think the thing I would add to it is we've got a real lens here at the moment around the homelessness. But it is called the vulnerable adult um, support team because it looks at vulnerable adults, not home. We don't silo any particular vulnerability. Um, and I think that's where the, 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 the team under the guidance of Sarah has been able to identify the issues that need to be picked up. It, 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 there isn't a name for it. It's vulnerabilities. So, yeah. so every ED will have vulnerabilities passing through their door. Absolutely. I think that's really important. Thank you. Are there any more questions before we move on? I'm really keen. Um, I think there's more for us to do in 